section 1.1 is mathematics and problem solving. So we're going to take a look at this in this section at some different methods and strategies for problem solving. To start with, we're going to talk about a four-step process. Um, a mathematician named Polya is actually credited with this. So if you see his name listed in any problems in your book, Polya's method, that's what this is. Yes, ma'am? Uh-huh. Don't care at all. Good question. You can do notes and whatever you so desire because, yeah, they're yours. Um, so the four-step method starts with understanding what the problem is asking. Um, so these are some questions that sometimes you can ask yourself to gain some insight into that direction. Can the problem be stated differently? What is it that I'm supposed to find or what am I missing? What are the unknown quantities? What information is obtained from reading what I'm given? What is missing or what is not needed? Um, you know, oftentimes in contrived mathematical settings, there's not a lot of that not needed stuff, but in real life, there's always information that's really not needed. Um, and so you have to kind of parse through that sometimes to make those decisions in real life situations. Devising a plan is often where students kind of get stuck because it feels like there's lots of options. Oftentimes there are natural choices and there are some that maybe aren't natural for particular problems. So this is a non-exhaustive, that means it's incomplete, there's other things that could be written here, list of some strategies that you could use. Looking for a pattern, examining related problems. I know you've done that related problems one before. Every time that you kind of go back in your notes to look for the problems and the teacher did that was kind of like the problem you're doing now, that's what that is. Um, examining a simpler or special case. We'll do, we will see an example of that one um, probably on Monday. Making a table or a list. How many of you are list makers? I am too. Does anybody add things to the list after you've done them just to mark them off? Me too. So um, lists can be really helpful or a way of organizing information. Um, identifying a sub-goal. This idea that there's sort of these steps in the process that if I can get here, then I know what I'm supposed to do next. Sub-goals can be useful. Diagrams. I'm not much of an artist, but I am a visual person, so diagrams can be quite helpful in certain situations. Um, guess and check is one of those things that sometimes we feel like it's somehow cheating. It's not cheating. <laughs> um, it may be not an efficient way of doing something, right? It's not fast, maybe, uh, but it sometimes can be quite useful. Um, I'm telling you what, sometimes when I parent with my youngest son, it's guess and check all the time. We're just going to see what happens if I try this <laughs> uh, because he, he throws things at me that I don't expect. Um, working backwards. I know you've done this strategy before as well. This is what you've done every time you look in the back of the book and you're like, how'd they get that answer? <laughs> and then you try to kind of backtrack it and see where that answer came from. Um, working backwards can be quite useful. Um, write an equation. Um, that's probably where you've spent the majority of the last few years in high school anyway of your mathematics time is you're looking at word problems and you're creating an equation to solve them. That's fine. Equations are great. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, but for the purposes of this class and for the purposes of most of the kids you guys are going to be teaching, it's not really where we're going to focus our attention. Um, we're going to look at these other strategies because equations usually don't happen, you know, in fourth grade. Uh, or second grade. But there's often one of these other strategies that can be used to solve the same kind of problems that we solve with equations with much younger children. So you'll see that happen as we're working. Not always, but many times you can. Step three, after you've decided whatever plan you want to use, you do it. Carry out the plan. Implement the strategy, perform necessary computations. Attend to precision in language and, mathematically, um, and mathematics used. Check each step along the way, either formally, that means like, you know, you plug the number in multiple times or you check it with a calculator and you do it by hand, or informatively, intuitively asking yourself, does this make sense? And to keep an accurate record of your work. If you're not showing your work and you make a mistake, it's really difficult to go back and figure out what the mistake was because you don't have anything to go back to. All right, so keep a log, keep an accurate, accurate record of what you're doing, and then just check your work. Um, checking your work means deciding if your answer is reasonable. If you're trying to find out the number of babies born in 1956 and you come up with 232.7, you've got a problem. No 0.7 babies, right? It doesn't work like that. 
um, you know, if the answer is drastically larger or smaller. Like, not only was my answer just right there, sort of weird because I put the 0.7 on there, but it wasn't very big. That shouldn't be the number, right? It should be much larger than that. Is it reasonable? And then aside from reasonability also, is it accurate? Like, if I repeated the process, would I have made, did I make any mathematical computational kinds of errors in what I did too? Did I put the decimal in the right location if that's a play, you know, an issue, that kind of stuff. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do at least one example. This is mm, quite possibly not something you have seen before, and it is a very interesting problem. Um, this comes from a gentleman named Gauss, um, and he actually was a famous mathematician. Um, when he was in early grade school, so you're thinking like probably first grade-ish, his teacher gave the class an assignment intending it to take them a good deal of time. I know you guys wouldn't do that. You're better teachers than that, right? You're not going to give your kids busy work. The teacher was supposed to, or what the teacher asked them to do was to find the sum of the numbers from 1 to 100. So she expected them to go 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. And can you see why this should take a lot of time if you take that approach? Yeah, it would. Uh, unfortunately for her, um, her student Gauss answered almost immediately. So I'd like to show you what strategy he employed at a very young age. Obviously, I get he is um, a very uh, intelligent individual to have come up with this at a young age. Um, but it is a really cool strategy for you to be aware of for using in the future if you didn't need to add together a series of numbers. And I've actually done it. I can't remember what I was adding together. Oh, I know what it was. Um, I have two of my daughters, my two, my two daughters are going on a mission trip this summer. And one of the fundraisers they're doing is envelopes. And they have envelopes numbered from 5 to 35. I don't know if you guys have ever done this sort of before. And they go up to somebody and they say, will you support me for my, for my trip? I've got these envelopes from 5 to 35. You can pick any envelope and you just put the amount of money that's in that envelope. Okay? So my question was, if they actually filled, in my mind, if they actually filled up all their envelopes, how much money would they have? And I used this strategy to add it up, and I actually did it in my head because I'm familiar at this point with this strategy, and it works really nicely to do this. So let me show you how this strategy works, okay? So we're going to actually do the problem that Gauss did, which is the numbers from, from 1 to 100 specifically. Okay, so... First of all, we're just going to write down the problem sort of in an equation kind of a perspective. We're just going to write down 1 plus 2 plus 3. And we're just going to write the first three numbers, and we're going to put that dot, dot, dot that we like to put when we don't want to write things out any further. You know what I'm talking about, right? And we're going to do the last three numbers as well, which would be 98, 99, 100. So, I mean, this is the goal. The goal is to have, figure out what this sum is. Um, by adding these things together and to do so in, in some kind of an efficient way um, and not have to actually add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Everybody good so far? Okay. What I'd like for you to do underneath this is to write the same thing down in reverse order. So here's what I mean. It's still going to say S equals, but we're going to put the 100 first and we'll put the 1 last. a little bit better. I keep feeling like it's bigger than it is because I can zoom in and zoom out on my screen. Okay, look good so far? Here's what I would like for you to notice. If I were to add it the way we add in elementary school when we first learn addition, right, vertically, ignore the left-hand side where the S's are. I don't want to talk about that right now. But if I were to add the numbers, what's 1 plus 100? 101. What's 2 plus 99? 101. What's 3 plus 98? 101. Do you see a pattern? I do too. And it continues through the entire list of numbers until we get to the end, and we've got another 101, 101, and 101. Now, somewhere along for us at this point in school curriculum, 
you learn that when you add the same number together a whole bunch of times, there's a faster way to do that. What is it called? Multiplication. We usually do it about the end of second grade these days, okay? So in the second grade, third grade, they're still reminding themselves of it in fourth grade. <laughs> Got a fourth grader, I know. Um, but they're working on these multiplication ideas that it's faster if you memorize the multiplication facts than to repeat addition a bunch of times. Agree? Yeah. So if I knew how many of these things there are, I could simply multiply the number I'm getting, that 101, by the number of things that, it, that there are. Does that make sense? Okay. So the question then becomes how many of them are there. Now before I get to that, let's actually fill in the other side that I said let's skip before we go to the next line. What's s plus s? 2s. The idea is that we have simply doubled what we originally started with. That's what the 2 is actually from, is because we doubled the amount. Whatever the amount is, we now have twice as much because we've added it to itself. Okay? Okay, so I still start with the 2, I mean, I still have the 2s. I have 101 as my sum, and the question is, how many 101s do I have? 100. How do you know, Alicia? There are 100 numbers in our original sequence. Now, that's kind of convenient because, you know, we started at 1. We didn't skip anything along the way. So we'll talk next time about what happens when you don't start with 1 and you do skip things along the way. Let me finish it up real quick. We've got just about 30 seconds left to do so. What is 101 times 100? You probably should be able to look at it and tell me. 10,100. And then what would I do to find S, which was the actual goal? I would half it or divide by 2. So what is our sum? 5,050. And that is our famous mathematician's method for doing this problem. We'll extend it next class period.